turn to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter number 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 19. Matthew chapter number 8, and beginning in verse 19. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go, bear, go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed after him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O oh, ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper this morning, on the thought, what stands in your way. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that brought us this way this morning. Lord, we pray that you might this morning allow us to set every distraction aside. Lord, that we might focus for a time on you, the distraction of this world, uh, the distractions of home, the distractions of work, Lord, that every one of them might be set aside and we might focus on you. Lord, we know from your word, if we don't uh, meditate on your word, how can we know your will? Lord, we pray this morning that you'd bless the ones that sit before us, Lord, that you would uh, stir their hearts up, Lord, the saved to your service and the lost to salvation. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, I want to say, first of all, that it is without question the Lord wants you to progress in your faith. He wants you to move forward. And I don't care if you're uh, 12 or 112, you are to move forward. Now what I have found, because of the frailty of this body, often we quit to progress. We stop progressing. But let me say that, that even of that, it's an excuse. It is an excuse when we don't go forward. It is an excuse when we don't make progress in the things of the Lord. Now, at 100 years old, you might not be doing mission work, but you should be progressing in the faith. We should be drawing closer unto our Lord. Now, with that thought in mind, go back with me to verse 19, and a certain scribe. Now, scribes were very important to the Judeo uh, economy because they did not have printing presses. They didn't have a way to mass produce the law. They didn't have a way to mass produce the mosaic history of God's people. And so you had to have scribes that were accurate in rewriting the Word of God over and over and over again, year after year, century after century, to maintain what the Word of God says. And uh, so I want you to see that he knew the Word of God. Now this morning, just because you know the Word of God, don't make you redeemed. Just because you know what the Bible teaches does not make you saved. He knew the Word of God backwards and forward much more than we do. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now listen, that's a mouthful to be said this morning. And you you know what? This is the sad truth this morning. Most of, the, most of us don't even have a desire to say it. To say it. Most of us don't have a desire to say, Lord, if you lead me in that direction, I will surely go. And you know why? It's the hindrances of this world. We Listen, we're so involved with money. We are so involved with what this world has to offer. 
And you know, it never ceases to amaze me how we let that interfere. Uh, listen, uh, have you ever not had the provision of the Lord? Uh, did any of you come here hungry this morning? Certainly not. We had, we had more and to spare at home. And still we come, not with a mind that we might serve Him, but rather with a mind that might worry uh, about what tomorrow may bring. And so I want you to see when he said, I'm going to, if you lead me across the world, that's where I'm going to go. Now that's a mouthful. It also is a mouthful when he leads you next door. When he, when he, takes, when he takes you to that place of uncertainty, that's a mouth to be said. And then he says, and the Lord said unto him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. You know why? Because he was a pilgrim. He, he did not belong here. The Bible says very clearly, we're pilgrims and strangers. And we can quote that, and we can say that, but you know what? It really means nothing to us. There's not a person under the sound of my voice that didn't have a good, warm place to sleep last night. Had a nice bed, had a nice home, and, and then we talk about service to God. You know what? And did you notice he mentioned the animals, but he didn't mention mankind. You know what that says to me? We're not guaranteed that. Now, we like to think we are. But where is our satisfaction supposed to come from? With food and raiment, be there with content. So he didn't, he didn't guarantee mankind. He didn't even use us as an example. He used the animals. And so I want you to see if this scribe followed him. And, and we have no documentation that he did or that he didn't. But if he followed him, the, the Lord let him know what lay ahead. You know what lays ahead for God's people if you stand true to the Word of God? Trouble is on the way. You, you think we have it bad? Listen, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, uh, everybody says, well, the Lord's protecting hand is around us. And I know that. It's the very truth. But when you say that, remember all His promises for this flesh is food and raiment. You know what? They may come in and take your house. Everybody, oh, I've got a nice home. Well, I'm glad you knew. You know what? You may not always have it. That's right. <coughs> you know what? Uh, you go into me and Donna's closet, and it's a big closet. I remember when we looked at that double wide, uh, I thought, man, we'll have, food, we'll have room enough to spare. And now you have to get in there like this when you're going to pick out your clothes. And you know what? It may get down to one outfit. Yeah. It, it may it may get down to one to one little plea, to one little piece to put on. And I want you to see that's all that we're offered. That's all we're guaranteed. And you know what? If we begin to think in that light, I believe we can thank and praise the Lord every day, all day, for the extras that He's provided above food and raiment. But uh, oh, we don't do that. We begin to uh, wish our hands and worry and where's this coming from and where's that? And you say, oh, Brother Larry, uh, I don't do that. Yes, you do. I do it and you do it and everybody does it. Right? And so we see then, we see then that this young scribe knew what he was getting into if he followed him. Verse 21 and another of his disciples said to him, Suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Now I want you to see that this young man got the, got the opportunity to prioritize. Now, I don't know how many of you, I, many of you under the sound of my voice have buried your father. I, I buried mine. Uh, it, it can be a sad day, but uh, I, I preached my father's funeral, and that, that's an unusual thing. Most people don't get that opportunity. And I, I remember very well that I was uh, 
uh, I walked from the house. We lived in that little brick house in Bumpus Mills at that time. And I don't know how many foster children we had. We had a brood to get together. And Donna, and I was supposed to meet at the, the hearse at the church at a certain time and unlock the building. And so I was waiting and Donna, and so you know how I can be a little funny about time. So I just took off and walked up to the church building. Wasn't very far. And, and walked up to the building. Now I often think, what if on my way up to the building, somebody had stopped to me and said, share with me the gospel. I've often thought what, 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 what it would have been if somebody came by and said, could you ride with me down to the hospital? There's someone dying. Well, I've often thought, you know, what if there was a spiritual interruption would I have been willing to walk away? And if I did, and that's a big if, I, I honestly, I just, especially at that stage of my life, I wasn't at 25, I probably wouldn't have. But if I had walked away, and if I had just simply go to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, what would people have said about me? You ever think about that? Well, a Blackfoot boy was supposed to preach his daddy's funeral and didn't even show up. Right? But you know the thing of it is, Dad was dead. I could do nothing for him. Was it honorable to preach his funeral? I guess in one sense. And I got the opportunity to share the gospel. But this is the thing. Dad was dead. What could I do for him? In the, in the span of time and eternity, there was nothing to be done for him. He was gone. Right? And so as we look at that, we see this young man, he wanted to address things in a worldly standard. He had his father's funeral at a higher priority than he did the service of God. Right? Uh, that, that, that's the real story here. He had not placed serving God a priority. And let me say this. When you get to that, that point where you're serving God truly comes first, people will look at you like you're an idiot. Yeah. You, you, you won't be, you won't be uh, complimented on that. You get those little sneers. Well, you know what? He won't even provide for his own family. That, that's what you'll get. It, 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 won't be con, it, it won't be accolades. And so we see then that as the Lord Jesus Christ here, He's saying, put yourself in priorities. Be sure that you know what you're talking about. Verse 23 says, And when He was entered into a ship. Now, let me say this. this there was a number of times that He crossed a body of water with his disciples. This wasn't the night when they rolled all night long. It wasn't the night when he came to them walking on the sea. It wasn't the time he said, cast your net on the other side. It wasn't any of those times. It was a separate incident. It even wasn't the incident with the maniac of Gadara. And I'll show you that just in a minute by, by the word of God. It was a separate incident. And you know what that says to me? There's a lot of water to cross before we get home. There is a lot of places to cross. And listen, when you get out there, you don't know what's going to be there. And you know what all I can say? Just trust Him. Well, you think about the biggest body of water you've ever seen. I guess the biggest body of water I've ever seen was the Atlantic Ocean as I was flying over it to go uh, to, to Europe. And about midway... You can see nothing but water. There's nothing else to see. You go on and on, and, and that's about a 12-hour flight to go across the Atlantic Ocean. It, it, it takes a long time to get there. Now, really, there's a measure of trust. Now, it's carnal trust. It's not like trusting in Christ, but I was trusting a lot of things. I was trusting we had enough fuel to get one to one side or the other. I was trusting that that, fly, that that pilot had the ability to get me there over across the sea, and I really didn't even know it. Right? I, I was trusting that that machine 
was worthy enough, it had enough working power that it would get me across there. And you know what a lot of people don't understand? When you get in the plane the next time, kick back and think about this. <laughs> they don't get a lot of rest. Did you know that? They get about enough time for refueling, and that's it. And they're back in the sky again. Your car gets more time of rest than a plane does. And so we see then, we see then, there's a great deal of trust in following the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he had entered into a ship, now I want you to see also, he did not invite them to go. Many, many times he does. Many times he does, but he never said, come follow me. He, he never said, go to me in this ship. If you remember on the night when he came to them walking on the sea, he even commanded him, he said, you get into the ship and go to the other side and I'll meet you there. He didn't tell them, they simply followed. You know what that is? That's a blind faith. That's just going because you think it's good for you. Now, I want you to see that most of us do not have a blind faith. We do not follow in that way. And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, in so much the ship was covered with waves. Now, I want you to get the picture there that they followed and they were out on the sea and then the waves began to roll. You know what I found about God's people? They haven't changed much since the ministry of Christ because they're good to go until the waves come up. And then it's, oh, what are we going to do now? Well, what's going to be the next step? Brother Larry had to get us here. Right? Fine, as long as the sailing's good, but you let the first storm come up, and I do want you to see this. It did not really, it just said waves. Right? It didn't really say anything about rain, did it? Just waves. You know what that tells me? That God's people don't know how to ride the waves. They, they don't know how, and, and when the storm comes up, when the waves get rough, we begin to wring our hands and wonder and, 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 uh, and, and, and look at a situation from a brand new point. And behold, there arose, arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much the ship, the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And when his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Now, do you believe God's sovereign? I do. And if God's sovereign, each part of the Godhead has to be sovereign too. A lot of people say, well, you know, Jesus was limited by the flesh. I don't believe a bit of it. <laughs> he, told, he told one disciple this morning he was sitting under a tree. He, he, knew, he, he knew where he was. Right? He said, Peter, go catch that fish. It's a specific fish. When you get it, pull the money out and pay the man. It's not like a sovereign God to me. And, and so we see then, uh, when, when we're in this situation, we forget the God we serve. We forget the Lord Jesus Christ. When the storm comes up and the waves begin to roll, oh my God, He's not able. You know what? If He's able to save your soul, He's able to preserve this flesh as long as He will. But you know what? It's not hoo-hoo good times, but if the Lord does not return, you will die. All oh, these people says, well, I just believe I'll be here when the Lord returns where you may be and you may not be. Right? He says, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. No, not the Son of Man. That means Christ don't even know. Right? He doesn't know yet. Son, go get my children. He don't know yet. And, and, and so we see then the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> that we should trust Him invariably. So what stood in their way? The storm. What stood in their way of progression? Was it just the storm? It was really the lack of trust. 
Storms are coming. I'll guarantee you that. Storms are on their way. I'm not going to give you a health and wealth theology. Number one, it's not biblical. And number two, it doesn't exist. And so the storms are coming, but the problem is this, is huh, it stands in our way. You know what? If the Lord Jesus Christ is leading you to a place, get up and go. And when you got up and go, you know what? More than likely, there's going to be opposition. And you know what? Everybody says, well, the devil's the opposer. He is. But you know he can only go as far as God says to. Remember, he was very much in control of that situation with Job, was he not? Sure he was. Down to the last minute detail. If I understand that book like I think I do, he under he so the storms are coming, but what's in your way this morning? Is it a storm? Is it unbelief? You know what I see among God's people? The biggest thing is their opposition is indifference and lack of love. Oh me. Of some have compassion making a difference. You say, oh God's sovereign. It don't make any difference anyway. Listen, don't you ever use God's character as an excuse for you to do nothing. You know what that is? It's blasphemous. It, it, it really is. You're, you're out there in a pool of water you don't know nothing about. So get up and do something. What, what, what's, your, what's your opposition today? And we can come up with hundreds of things. I've got to work. I've got to provide for my family. I've got to do this. And I've got to do that. And, and you know what it is? I understand all those situations. But don't use them as something to stand in your way. When you get there, God will give you His plan. But you've got to get there. Now notice this. <clears throat> and His disciples came to Him and awoke Him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. And He saith unto them, Why are you fearful? Now you answer that for yourself this morning. Why are you fearful? Why do you have no concern? Why is it that you're bored? Why? Why would you rather to be somewhere else than here? Why? All those questions will lead you to the answer of why you're not doing something. Now who do we want to always blame? God, do we not? You can say, well, no, I really blame my husband. Well, in a sense, you're blaming God. Our, our indifference to sin. You know what? For 22 years now, I have very tried to faithfully preach this book concerning separation from this present evil world. And I know people get sick of me harping on it. I've had people to invite me to preach because they knew what I was going to preach when I got there. But you know what the real thing concerning separation is this. It keeps you, numb. It keeps you from being numb to this world. Man. You get out there and waller in it long enough, yeah. you're not going to tell the difference between one and the other. That's what makes sodomites marrying okay to most today. You know what? They've been around it so long, they don't even know the difference. <coughs> no. And why did they get out in that situation? That right there. If you had one man offering your job for $40,000 a year, and it was a nice small company, a place where they feared God, or you got eighty thousand, but the next the desk next to you had a nice sodomite sitting there with his boyfriend. Which one do most people take? Eighty sounds better than forty, don't it? To the flesh. To the flesh. And so we see then 
We see then as the Lord's people that, that, that we've got to figure out what stands in front of us. And once we figure that out, we, got, we all get to mind, oh, it's smooth sailing now. I figured it out. I know what God's going to want from me. I know what He's going to do. The Lord Jesus stands up and rebukes the winds and the waves. They settle out. And then notice what He comes and says. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What matter of man is this, that the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side, into the country of Gergesusness, there met him two, possessed with the devil coming out of the tombs, exceeding furious, so that there was no man that would pass that way. Was the problem solved like that? In one sense, yes. They were rebuked for their lack of confidence in the ability of the Lord. But that situation calmed down. Everything got fine. And they got to the other side. And immediately met opposition again. Right? Yep. I, I would say their, their little time of calmness was very short lived. Their, their, little, their little time of smooth sailing wasn't very long to they met opposition again. But this is the command of the Lord. He said, go across to the other side. You know what? Nothing would have pleased the devil any more than them not following through. And when they got to the other side, the impulse of the flesh would be this, not even to get off the boat. Now, have you ever some, seen anybody that was demon-possessed? I think I have. Not real pleasant to be around. You know what? B Baptist people minimize demon possession. But devil possession is still a very, very real thing. And you be cautious to people you deal with. I, I've seen people that most would wrap them up as too insane when they literally would claw their arms until they bled. You know what? That happened in the Bible all the time. Demons are this. When they're through with you, they'll destroy you too. That's what they did to Judas. So don't think you're going to be pleasing to the devil because when he's through with what you, he wants you to do, he'll take care of you too. <clears throat> that, 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 that's his nature. And so we see then that the, the problems did not end. <clears throat> it went from a storm standing in their way to literally two de demon-possessed men standing in their way. And you know what? When, when the Lord Jesus uh, rebuked the demons and they went away and they also went into a, to a herd of swine. Again, I still think it's two separate instances. I think there was the maniac of Gadara and I think it was these two too. Gennesaret is a different place, right? But the result was the same. Did people rejoice that demons were defeated? No. Do people rejoice today when demons are defeated? Few and far between. Few and far between. And you know why? They're so caught up in it much, so much their self, they don't even get it when it happens. In fact, people like me are accused of being bigots. Because we want to prove sin. And that, 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 that's what you'll see. Now, look with me, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, uh, the famous passage, the Lord dealing with the man, the religious man, Nicodemus. We find what was standing in Nicodemus' way. Now, we see demons and we kind of quiver at demons, but you know, regular, everyday stuff is what stands in our way. Everyday, routine stuff is what, what is in our way this morning. John chapter 1 and the, uh, I mean, John chapter 3 in the very first verse, in the third, I'm sorry, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, 
We know that thou art teacher come from God, for no man can do us these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now why did he come at night? Did you ever think about that? What because he was too busy during the day? <laughs> it didn't. It wasn't the fact that he didn't clock out at, at the school until four thirty. The fact was this: he was embarrassed of the Lord Jesus Christ. That that did it stand in his way? You bet it did. So we go from demonic possession and, and the weather and the elements of this world to something simply as pride. That was his real problem. He, he was too proud and too glad of his own situation to go down there and talk with the sinless Son of God. What about you? Does pride get in your way? Are you too embarrassed to stand up on the street corner and look like an eight ball? You know what stands in your way? Pride. That's what it is. And, and so we see then that the Lord Jesus Christ rebukes Nicodemus and, said, and brings him down to everyone else's level, this righteous Jew that was a Jew among Jew, he says, you must be born again, and there's nothing you can do about it. Brought him right down where he belonged. And I don't think Nicodemus was saved until much later, that's my own opinion, but it was his problem. It stood in the way of progression. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. We, it. we referred to this just a little bit before. The Lord's really led me, and I'm not understanding why I'm very frequently to preach on this lately. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. If you know where you're at in the Bible, it was the temptation of Christ. And the devil taketh him, meaning Christ, up to an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith to them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if they will if if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now a couple of things that's often missed in this. First of all, I do want you to see the devil has the ability to go where he wants to go including before the throne of Almighty God. That's how he got a situation with Job, was it not? Now, you say, oh, that, that's, you know, he does that when he will. No. The Bible says the sons of God <laughs> came before God. And you know what? It was his time to do it, and he did it because he's under God's ability. And you know what? One day you will stand before him as well. Because you are his creature. And the lost are his creatures. The redeemed are his creatures. And you will stand before him. And you will give an accounting of exactly what you've done. Even to the point of being a fake. Even to the point of hearing <coughs> message after message after message. And it's just like water on a duck's back. You say, well, you know, if I'm an elect, listen, you know, you better throw that to the side because the Bible, in addition to the election, says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Right? It's both ways. And so we see then that Nicodemus' pride stood in the way. We find here that the, the devil himself stood in front of Jesus. Now, do you remember... Uh, <laughs> A young man, a ruler, <laughs> that had to have his leg broke to get his attention. And even when his leg was broke, the, uh, the, the angel of the Lord was in front of him telling him to go this way. He says he was swinging a, spit, uh, a sword of fire. And finally the ass had to preach to him. He says, why has you done me thus? 
You know, it's pretty sad when, when the animal life can see God in things and we can't. But often we get to that point, do we not? Often we forget that, that God is the very God sovereign of the universe. And so we see that the devil went to this place and he desired worship. You know what the devil still desires today? He desires worship. You know one of the most wicked, ungodly outfits that's growing by leaps and bounds in this country is Wicca. Or Wiccan, it's sometimes referred to. And they're nothing more than covens of witches. And that's what they are. You know, uh, some of them will sell themselves as good witches. There's no such thing. Because you know what? They do not honor God in any way. You say, well, do they have powers? You bet you. And you know why? Because they're, they're the devil's servants. He's granted, he's granted powers to people before, has you not? Verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt not worship the Lord thy God. Uh, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Two things, and we're going to move on. First of all, I want you to see, don't try this one. <laughs> because you don't have the ability to rebuke the devil. That's under the sovereign hand of God. But the Bible does say, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, it's not because you have authority and you send him on his way. He gives up real easy. Okay, I'm not going to get anywhere with him. There's lots of other people that's going to follow me. Uh, going to listen to what I say. I'll just go with somebody else. So resist him. When he gives you those ungodly inclinations, resist him. When he would rather you watch TV than the word of God, than read the word of God, resist him. When, when, when uh, you would rather sleep than spend some time in prayer, resist him. We need to resist the devil. And I really believe that's one thing our, our churches are so weak in Beverly today is we do not resist the devil and he has his own way time and time and time again. Look with me in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to read one thing there because it sets us at a, at a handicap and we need, to be, we need to be very, very aware of, of where we stand. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Most of you can quote it. Chapter 17, uh, verse 9. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what that means? It means the heart is desperately wicked. It means that it is deceitful. You know, we, we get in our mind these little things that our children come before God. You better perish the thought. They're down here. We get in our mind that our wives become from God, become before God. You better get that out of your head. God's first. Amen. Should you honor your wife? Certainly. Should you take care of your children? You bet you. But they do not come before God. And if God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, you don't hook them up with a ball team that plays on Sunday. You don't hook them up with a ball team that practices on, on uh, Saturday, I mean on Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. Anything that interferes with the house of God, you run. I don't understand these people today. See, you, you know, uh, so you, you, you can't find nobody preaching hardly anymore about women wearing, the, that their garment is, uh, is a dress, can you? And you know, uh, the Bible says very clearly that the woman is to, to wear that that pertaineth unto a woman. You, you, you don't hear that anymore. And you know why? Because preachers don't want to leave, lose their congregation. And you know what I found? If you preach that and you stick to it and say a woman is to wear that which pertaineth unto a woman and a man, uh, and all of it be modest, you know what I found? You have a number about like this. <laughs> That's all you're going to get. And, and so we see, we see this morning that we, to, we need to understand what we are so when we see the opposition, when that thing is before us, we know if we're not very careful, we'll turn and go the other way. 
not going forward in the things of God. That, that is the problem today, is it not? Colossians chapter 1, we're almost done. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians 1, Paul, uh, Paul writing to the church at Coloss says, By him were all things created. Now, you get that really good because we, we think of the trees and the flowers, and certainly they were, and you know we get ready for a group hug. But when it says all things, it means all things. You know who the devils were created by? They were created by God. Now, did they rebel? Did they get cast into the earth? You betcha, but God made them. All things were created by God. That means, whether we want to admit it or not, that automobile accident was created by God. That thing that took us to the hospital was created by God. Right? Can we say he's sovereign and come to any other conclusion that he made the mountain? But he also said that we have the power. Faith is a tiny grain of mustard seed to move that mountain. Say, get you.